several decades after Jesus' death, crucifixion, and resurrection, there was an insurrection in Jerusalem and in, in Judea against the Roman ruling authorities. And it had to do with progressive Roman repression of Jewish religious practices. And the, the, the upheaval against this Roman uh, rule was so enormous that the Romans, in their retaliation, destroyed the temple. Imagine. And slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Jewish people living in Jerusalem and the environs. And then 50 years later, in 130 AD, they completed the job. And Jews were not permitted to live in Palestine anymore. They were sent away. And so the calamity of the exile is upon them again. They were attempting to follow God, they thought, as best they knew how. And this horrendous calamity comes their way. It didn't just come their way in 130 AD. Two centuries before Jesus, Antiochus Epiphanes, a Syrian emperor, had um, declared all-out war against the Jewish people. Why? He wanted to be viewed as God, as the final authority. And the Jews says, no, Yahweh is the final authority. It's not, it's not Antiochus Epiphanes. And um, so they, uh, they, uh, they, they refused to accept that. Then Antiochus Epiphanes went and put a, a uh, idol in the temple and associated with that idol, he, just imagine, he introduced the sacrifice of pigs to this pagan divinity. Now, a pig in Judaism is not even to be touched. It's not to be eaten. It's an unclean animal. And Antiochus Epiphanes forces the Jews to offer sacrifices of pigs to this pagan god in their temple. And if they refused to do that, they were killed. And the vast majority refused to do it and died as martyrs. Well, the same sort of thing is happening now under the Romans in 70 AD and 130 AD, uh, after the death and crucifixion of Jesus, that the same sorts of things are developing again around that temple situation. And so Israel is sent into exile, into diaspora. They're not even permitted to live in the land for many centuries. They become a people going from location to location to location, people of the diaspora. Why? Why? Oh, they say, perhaps it's because we're not obeying the law of God fully. That's probably the reason. You remember when the exile first took place? Back in 586 AD, that's the reason that they went into exile, they believe. They're not obeying God fully. And under Ezra and Nehemiah, when they returned from the exile, they determined they're not going to compromise anymore. They're going to really apply the Torah in every aspect of life, as the Torah was now being written, being formed in its present form. And, uh, and, and as these scriptures were, were making their circulation, they determined to follow these scriptures fully. And now, after Christ, uh, this this additional disaster of the Romans. And so they decide, although they're now in diaspora, they're not living in Israel, Palestine anymore. Although they're in diaspora, they're scattered. They decide that they're going to work at developing a, an understanding of what it means to obey the will of God, the will, law of God, uh, fully. And that leads to the formation of the Talmud. It began in, in uh, Galilee, the writing of this Talmud. It continued, it, then it migrated to Babylonia. And this writing of the Talmud continued for 350 years. 
from generation to generation, rabbis would pass on the baton to the next generation to carry forward this effort. A massive tome, huge. What is the Talmud? It is a massive collection of rabbinic teachings and traditions and interpretations of the Torah, of how it should be applied to life. A huge scholarly enterprise consuming ge several generations of scholars investing in this vast, 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 vast scripture. It is it's just a phenomenal undertaking. In six major parts, 63 volumes have been as meat and drink to the tragic Jews who fled from east to west and back again during the long ordeal of the Middle Ages. Its physical bulk has had, and this constitutes a rather exceptional circumstance, no little relation to its spiritual inexhaustibility. It has served as a rampart of moral resistance that rose higher and stood firmer than the brick and stone of the ghetto walls that Europe raised to hem the Jew in. Though condemned as magic and as devil's lore, burned in the marketplaces by angry civil authorities, or torn apart page by page and thrown on the waters, the Talmud always survived to feed the souls of a persecuted people determined to live by its regulations or have no further part in it. Others might laugh at what was contained in it, but to the Jew, it was the wisdom which was of God. A description of the Talmud. In their diaspora, this vast tome became a definition of their peoplehood and helped to hold them together as a people over the centuries as they are sent from place to place. And then in 1896, um, Theodore Herzl, Theodore Herzl wrote a book called The Jewish State, in which he argued that the reason the messianic reign has not yet come is because the Jews have not yet returned to the land that God had promised to them. And that they should return to the land and to the place where the temple had been built and this will prepare the way for the Messiah to return. This Jewish state vision, this Theodore Herzl. And um, that became a very powerful uh, drive within the Jewish people to find a way to return to Palestine. That was their hope, that they could do that. And this book, as I say, very much fed that hope. Well then, fast forward to the Holocaust, um, where seven million Jews died in Hitler's gas chambers. <laughs> Every Jew in Europe wanted to get out, if at all possible. A horrendous calamity. And I remember in 1947, our family was returning from the United States to go back to Africa. And our ship, a huge troop ship with huge dormitory rooms in it, just at the end of World War II, our ship docked at um, Genoa, Italy. And there was just hundreds, if not thousands of Jews on the dock wanting to get on our ship. And multitudes got on. Our ship was going to stop at Haifa and then go on to Alexandria. And when we stopped at Haifa, the British officers didn't know whatever to do because the Palestinians were saying, enough have come. You know, our land is overwhelmed with this huge wave of people flowing into Palestine. And the British were politically in control. 
of Palestine at that time. They didn't know what to do. I know all night long, uh, depth bombs would go off. Our ship would just boom, boom, so that anyone trying to swim ashore would be killed. And all day long, British gunboats circulating, circulating around our ship, round and round and round. That was in 47, just a couple months later. The war broke out, and it, the State of Israel was formed in 1948. And um, multitudes of Jews, particularly from Europe who had survived the Holocaust, poured into that state and made their homes there and settled there. What does all of that mean? What does it mean theologically? What does it mean religiously? What's God's grand plan? Where's it all going? I don't know. But uh, it is an ongoing challenge. This, um, this um, um, commitment to returning to the land that God had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. To all of Abraham's progeny, certainly Ishmael likewise. Um, what does that mean? <clears throat> TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. And in the midst of all of that questioning about what all of this means, um, it's amazing that there is a growing number of persons across Israel and Jews around the world who are saying, you know, Jesus is the Messiah. They often refer to these people as Messianic Jews, Jews who have, who have uh, come to faith, in Jesus, who believe that he is the, is the Messiah. And these little congregations, in the United States now there's some 300 of them, I believe, of uh, Messianic believers in Jesus. And so there is, uh, we said right from the beginning, there was controversy, not all Jews embracing the fact that he would be the Messiah. But that controversy continues even today, and it is further uh, encouraged by the fact the reality that there are growing numbers of Messianic congregations across Israel today. And there's also Palestinian Christians. And one of the hopes, as I see it, for reconciliation and restoration is these Palestinian Christians and Jewish believers in the Messiah meeting with each other, attempting to work at reconciliation um, to find the way forward. One of the things they do is to go into the desert occasionally for camel safaris. And they'll put a Jewish young person and an Israeli young person on the same camel. And so for a whole day, you trek together across the desert, <laughs> you know, with the old camel taking you across the desert. Uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> you probably become friends. <laughs> but that's not the end of it. The next day, you're back on the camel again. They take two weeks or one week or sometimes three weeks camel treks through that desert that way, climb Mount Sinai together. And then in the evenings, these Jewish believers in the Messiah and uh, Palestinian believers in the Messiah, they sit around the campfire and they discuss what does it mean to be a reconciled people. Jesus came to bring reconciliation. How shall we live as a reconciled people in these circumstances where we're so divided and so forth and so forth. And so they become a kind of salt in the, uh, in the situation a seasoning the situation with a commitment to reconciliation. It's, uh, it's uh, truly, truly uh, uh, amazing uh, that, uh, that, that, that development that's taking place today. Yeah. So it's hopeful. There's a hopeful sign there, I think, in these reconcilers uh, who uh, are so involved in trying to build peacemaking relationships between one another.